We don't like jellyfish because they sting us and none of us wants to get stung because it hurts. So the whole idea of jellyfish is something that we kind of wrinkle our noses at and just basically say, eh, don't want it. But there's a lot more going on with jellyfish these days than just simply having a few stings when we go to the beach. You know, we see headlines in the newspaper like 100,000 farmed salmon being killed by a giant swarm of jellyfish that's 10 kilometers in diameter and 35 feet deep. And we see headlines in the paper of a young child that's stung very badly by jellyfish and hospitalized in Southern Ireland. And we see lethal jellyfish on Dublin beaches. And you know, we're starting to go, hang on, what the heck is going on out there? So there's a lot of myths and truths going on with this as well. So, um, you know, there's the implication that jellyfish are uh, new to Ireland, and that's simply not true at all. We've had jellyfish here for a long time. Um, but there's also the implication that the lion's mane, which was blamed for the girl being stung and for being on Dublin beaches, um, and that the lion's mane is lethal, which simply isn't true at all except in a Sherlock Holmes story, where it was used as a murder weapon, by the way. So, you know, it, it gets a bad rap. Um, you know, but then there's also the question of are lethal jellyfish present in Ireland? And actually, surprisingly, the answer to that is yes, and I'll get back to that in just a moment. And then there's also another question that's surrounded in this stuff, and that's are jellyfish on the rise? And it turns out that it depends on where you're talking about and what sort of circumstances. So I'll get into that as well shortly. So this is the lion's mane, the beautiful, beautiful lion's mane. Well, I think so, you know. Um, but like I said, you know, it's not actually a lethal animal except in Sherlock Holmes' mind. Um, this is the Portuguese man of war. Sometimes lethal, but not usually lethal, and apparently not even involved in the girl's case where she was so badly stung, although the Portuguese man of war was also blamed for the sting. This, however, is sometimes lethal and was not blamed for the sting, but was probably what was going on. So this is a thing called an irukandji, and I have an irukandji with me. So um, this uh, in the picture is actually, see, notice, um, but I've got better fingernails now, but this is the same animal in that vial right there. Here, let me see if I can, just so you'll know. Okay, see, that's the same animal, okay, honest to God. So this is a little tiny, tiny type of a box jellyfish. There's about 16 species of irukandjis and counting. Um, I've named and classified um, 14 of the 16. Yay! And, um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. They're usually little and they all share a really weird feature in common, which is that they cause what we call Irukandji syndrome and it's extremely distressing. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and think that maybe some of you haven't heard about it, so I'm gonna go ahead and describe it briefly. Um, it's unbelievable. So you get stung by this little thing, you don't feel it, maybe you feel a little bit of tingly, that's about it. Well, about 20 minutes after the sting, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but you know, after a delay, you start getting severe lower back pain. And people describe it as feeling like um, a, an electric drill is drilling into their back. And then within a couple minutes of the back pain starting, you start getting severe nausea and vomiting. And I'm not talking a little bit of queasy, like when you, know, you have like, too much grease for breakfast or something. I'm talking serious nausea and vomiting, like vomiting every minute to two minutes for up to about 12 hours. So it's pretty horrible. And now that's just the sort of warming up to the syndrome itself. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so you've got the lower back pain going full bore, you've got the nausea and vomiting going full bore. Within another couple of minutes, you start getting the full syndrome. Difficulty breathing, um, laid out flat with full body cramps and spasms, rigid abdomen, headache, coughing, wheezing, um, you know, creepy skin feeling. People talk about um, spiders crawling on the skin or worms burrowing in the skin. Um, you know, all these things going on. My favorite symptom from this little guy um, is a feeling of impending doom. 
how good is that? You're thinking, hey, on that little guy, a feeling of impending doom. You've got to be kidding. Really serious. It turns out it's not just because you're afraid you're going to die. Uh, it's actually, it's you're afraid you're not going to die because you're so sick. <laughs> afraid it's true. So, um, so this little guy is one wicked little guy. Some of the other species of Arakanges actually cause um, a, a, a severe hypertension or a high blood pressure. And it can be, well, it's been recorded as high as 280 over 180, which any of you familiar with blood pressure would go, oh my God, you could have a brain hemorrhage, you could have heart failure. Yes, and people do, people do. Not everybody, but some people do. So it's very serious. So I actually think that what uh, got the girl recently down south was um, an Arakanji. So that brings up all kinds of questions of what the heck is going on out there. So let's look a little bit more at what's going on with the oceans and jellyfish. Arakanjis are most well known in Australia because that's where they were first discovered and that's where they're uh, the best studied. But you know, we get them as far north as Ireland and as far south as Melbourne in Australia. So they're really throughout the usable oceans and seas of the world. So our oceans are changing and we're starting to see some really weird stuff going on with jellyfish and other creatures in the water as well. So let's think for a minute about what we want from the oceans and what we need from the oceans. Obviously, good, fresh seafood and plenty of it. And we want to be able to go fishing and catch really great fish that we can have really great photos from, <laughs> or with, I should say. Um, we want to be able to go scuba diving on beautiful reefs where we see lots of fish and corals and all these beautiful things. We want to be able to go surfing and enjoy, you know, adventure sports in the water. We want to be able to walk on beautiful, pristine beaches with the one that we love. We want to be able to have enjoyable experiences for our children to be able to explore and learn and wonder and see these amazing things. We want happy animals in the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere as well. And we want happy phytoplankton because we get half of our oxygen from the ocean. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty attached to every second breath I take. So <laughs> definitely want plenty of oxygen. <laughs> but there's something going on. It's not quite this straightforward in many, many places. In fact, it's not like that at all in many places. There's all these stressors that are happening in the ocean. Um, you know, they can be loosely grouped into several categories. We've got overfishing, we've got pollution, we've got climate change, we've got introduced species, um, you know, all these things, and then variations of those, ocean acidification, um, eutrophication, all these fancy words that, you know, uh, what they basically mean is that all of the stuff that we're doing as humans are having an effect in the ocean, and it's changing the balance of the things that live there. So fish are getting smaller and less numerous over time. And just this picture right here, I think, sums up so much. You know, the picture itself is iconic with these three different time frames there. But um, it really gives a feeling for the changes in these fish over time. We're getting fish that have all kinds of tumors and fungal problems and more tumors and yet more tumors. And these are just the fish that we can see. Um, the reality is we have no idea what a fish looks like when we buy a fish fillet in a, a, a supermarket or whatever. We have no idea. We're trusting that it's safe to eat. You know, it may have looked perfectly fine, but sometimes, as is so often the case, it's the toxins you don't see that are the real problem. There's thousands of kilometers of abandoned fishing nets and abandoned fishing lines and all kinds of things that are still out there catching fish for nothing. And nobody's going and harvesting them. They're just killing fish and will continue to forever, forever. We are burying ourselves in plastic. Every bit of plastic ever made still exists. It breaks apart, but it doesn't break down. So we are absolutely burying ourselves in plastic. 
Plastic has become a sixth food group for many organisms, particularly seabirds, but pretty much everything bigger than a piece of plastic is eating plastic because it's brightly colored, catches their attention, and it doesn't run away. So they can catch it quite easily. But seabirds in particular seem to be very badly affected by plastic, more so than just about anything else. You know, they see it, they dive on it, they catch it, it doesn't swim away. You know, they think it's a fish, obviously. Uh, they grab it, they eat it, it fills up their stomach, and they stop getting a hunger signal, and so they starve to death. Not only that, but the plastic concentrates toxins on the, on the outside, and so these, these pieces of plastic are acting like toxic bullets for these birds, and it's really, really, really bad for birds. Pests are having a field day. It's amazing how many pests are just taking over so many places. Red tides, uh, which are these incredibly abundant concentrations of microalgae or little phytoplankton, and they're very, very toxic. Um, they're toxic to fish, they're toxic to humans, and red tides are occurring more and more many, many places around the world in coastal ecosystems. They're very, very expensive. And more red tides. And hypoxia occurs partly from red tides. Oh, hypoxia is low oxygen. Um, and so um, red tides can cause hypoxia. Um, too much nutrients flowing into coastal waters can cause hypoxia. Uh, many um, chemicals that are being discharged into coastal areas cause hypoxia. All kinds of things can cause hypoxia, but fish don't do very well with it. Um, that's not a gravel road, by the way. That's dead fish and more dead fish, and more dead fish. And we're spewing unbelievable quantities of carbon dioxide, other greenhouse gases, all kinds of toxins into the air we breathe. And it's having an effect on us and on other organisms. And corals, because the waters are warming up, corals are really, really doing poorly. So what you're seeing here is in the foreground, uh, there's the brown coral that's got its uh, symbiotic algae, and then the white corals in the background have actually bleached and lost their algae. And if corals do this too many times, or for too long a period of time, they simply die, they can't get their algae back. And once the corals get overgrown with macroalgae, that's a permanent process. They don't recover from that. And many, many coral reefs around the world are being overgrown with algae, including many places on the Great Barrier Reef. Jamaica's pretty well lost. It's, it's really horrific. I could go on and on. Organisms are having a hard time finding food, either because there's less food available or because, in the case of polar bears, they need to get out on ice floes to go catch their food, and there's fewer ice floes. And so, you know, they're having a hard time struggling trying to find food, and they're actually becoming cannibalistic and eating their young. And you can imagine that when an, a species begins eating its young, that's a very self-limiting process for the survival of the species. As carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is being absorbed by the oceans, that's turning the uh, seawater to be more acidic. It's actually becoming corrosive. And so creatures with uh, skeletons and shells are simply disintegrating away, like osteoporosis disintegrates our bones. Similar process, actually. And so creatures like the sea butterflies, um, you know, they're cute little things. Pretty much everything bigger than a sea butterfly eats sea butterflies. They're cute in and of themselves, but, you know, but they are disappearing. And that's a huge food source for so many things. And corals are disappearing as well. But not all animals are disappearing. Some things are doing really, really well. Jellyfish, for example. So um, this is one of my favorite species, Catastylus. Um, the very first slide that I showed was a stunning photo of Catastylus. This, however, when they occur in these sort of numbers, this is not stunning. Well, it's awesome in the, like, oh my god, kind of way, but there's nothing beautiful about it. It's incredibly damaging to have this happening in the ecosystem because they eat everything in the ecosystem. And when I say jellyfish are doing really well, I mean jellyfish are doing really, really well. And they're clogging up fishing nets. This is in the Sea of Japan with these giant jellyfish that we've been hearing so much about the last couple of years. And many places, the jellyfish are actually out-competing the fish. And so places that had previously healthy uh, fisheries now have just lots and lots of fish coming up in their fishing nets. 
Power plants are being shut down by jellyfish getting clogged in the intakes. And it's becoming very hard to find a safe place to swim. Or even if you're a bird, to find a safe place to land. And we're finding lots and lots of these jellyfish problems being reported in mainstream media all over the world. So what the heck is going on? Something is going on. Well, several things are going on. One is, we normally think of the food chain in very linear terms. So big things eat little things, fast things eat slow things, smart things eat stupid things, right? So jellyfish take this and turn it on its head. The traditional food chain simply doesn't work when there's jellyfish around because you get jellyfish, which are much slower than fish, but they're eating the fish. Jellyfish, which have no brain, but they're eating the fish that have a brain. And jellyfish, which are often smaller than the fish, but they're eating the fish. Now you're going, wait a minute, how does that work? Well, it works because jellyfish do this very funny thing, but they do it really well. So jellyfish eat the eggs and larvae of fish, and they eat the plankton that the larvae would eat. So this double whammy of predation and competition can wipe out an ecosystem and keep it down. So it's a very, very simple thing that they're doing, but highly effective in flipping an ecosystem to being dominated by jellyfish. And we're seeing this many, many places around the world. Jellyfish also have a really weird life cycle, and this is a lot of how they do what they do. So when we see the jellyfish, that's only part of the life cycle. That's the medusa. When the medusa has babies, they don't grow up to look like another medusa. They grow up to look like a little tiny microscopic polyp, like a little tiny sea anemone. And these little polyps clone and clone and clone squillions of themselves. And then when the conditions are right, they bud off squillions of baby jellyfish, lots and lots and lots of baby jellyfish. And they're hungry and they eat everything they can get their lips around and they grow really fast. So when we think of weeds, we normally think of plants in the garden, but jellyfish in many ways are the perfect weed. Um, they've got that weird life cycle. They can clone in 13 different ways. Um, they don't need to see to eat. They just, whatever they catch on their tentacles. Um, they grow really fast. And if they can't find food, they don't need food. They just degrow real slowly. And then when they find food, they just regrow again. No harm, no foul. Um, they're temperature tolerant, they're salinity tolerant, and one species is truly biologically immortal. True, you can look it up. So we're inclined to think, oh my God, these evil jellyfish, they're taking over the world. But what I would like to leave you with is to think about something. It's not their fault. Jellyfish are simply responding to the conditions that we're giving them. Thank you.